All right, I think we've started to get people on and we are going to get things going here. This is Eli Spang from NARC and I want to thank you all to uh, welcome you all to this webinar today on GHG contribution analysis tools. And I want to thank our speakers today, Eli Udall from ICLEI, Maya Davis from Metropolitan Washington Council of Government, and Rob Graff from the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. We really appreciate having you all here to present. And uh, GHG emissions reduction is a big topic these days. States in the Northeast have been in multiple talks throughout the year working on the Transportation Climate Initiative, and regional councils throughout the country uh, have been increasingly looking at ways that they can address climate issues and tackling GHG emissions is a pretty good way to do that. ICLEI has developed tools for GHG contribution analysis and Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments and Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission have both put those tools to use. So today we're going to start with an introduction from ICLEI, who's, uh, from Eli from ICLEI, who's going to provide a little background information on what ICLEI does, as well as an overview of those tools. And then we're going to hand it off to Maya and then to Rob to talk a bit about their experience with the tools. So as the presentations progress, please post any questions you have in the chat module, and we'll save some time at the end to run through those. And the PowerPoint of the three presentations is put in the, um, in the handout section, and we'll also be sending that out uh, after the webinar is over. So without further ado, I will hand things off here to Eli Udall. All right. Thanks, Eli. We can go to the next slide. We can just skip to the one after this. So I'm going to start just giving some background, a little bit of background on ICLEI and greenhouse gas inventories, and then get into the contribution analysis. So uh, ICLEI, I'm with ICLEI USA, which is a network of around 200 cities and counties in the U.S. are working on various kinds of sustainability issues. You can kind of see on the map there what the distribution of those is. And uh, the total population, about 60 million in all those various cities and counties. And then we are also part of a, a larger global network of about 1,500 local governments. Next slide. So just some of the ways we work with, with those local government members through peer networking. We have a lot of luck with uh, cohort trainings where we'll have a, a group of cities either that may be in the same state or just uh, you know, across the country working on a, a similar thing like uh, inventories or climate action planning and we'll kind of work with them in a concerted way together to, to get that done provide tools and protocols, which I'll, I'll go over more in a minute, as well as other kind of information about best practices on, on various types of sustainability action. Next slide. I just wanted to give some idea of the, the breadth of our, our work. Our, our main focus is on climate mitigation, also some work on uh, climate adaptation, but I did want to just kind of highlight we, we also have work around renewable energy, biodiversity, and, and nature in cities, regional food systems, and sustainable procurement. Next slide. We're also working with a number of cities right now uh, as a provider to uh, the Department of Energy under the Soul Smart program and helping these uh, cities through the steps to become Soul Smart certified, which is I mean, they kind of put policies in place to be as, as friendly as possible for local solar development. Next slide, please. And another important part of, of uh, the way we work with cities is through our, our online community, which is a space where cities kind of organize different topics and cities can go in there or ask questions, uh, share information with one another, as well as ask information of our, our technical experts. Next slide. So switching to kind of introduce to the, the greenhouse gas inventories and some quick background on, on what those are and why you would do one. Um, if you can 
You can see it's a little bit so the rest of the text come up. Perfect. So there's, there's really two main benefits to doing a local greenhouse gas inventory. The first is to know what those largest sources of emissions are. This helps you plan to target your reduction actions where they can have the, the biggest bang. And to also uh, help you identify potential cost savings from, from energy saving actions, I mean, whether those cost savings might be to the local government directly themselves or to residents and businesses within the community. And the other main purpose of the, the greenhouse gas inventory is, is to be able to track performance over time uh, to see how your emissions are going up or down and, and to see if you're on track with, with targets the local government set as far as reduction. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of the, the type of data that typically comes out of a, a community level greenhouse gas inventory. So this would be for a city or a county and, and looking at kind of within that geographic boundary, or it could be a, a region as well, what all the residents and businesses within, within that region. So the typical biggest sources there are transportation, on-road transportation, the personal vehicles as well as, as freight vehicles, and also the, the built environment, so commercial buildings, residential buildings, and the energy use within those. <laughs> and it, it varies from place to place, kind of depending on the types of buildings, on how clean the electricity is, and in some cases, you know, one or Another of those three might be the, the most important. One of the reasons you do an inventory is you kind of learn you know, which, which of those is, is most important to focus on. And then there are some smaller sectors like solid waste and wastewater that we also look at. Next slide. So if you, by doing an inventory over, over multiple years, you can see kind of not only where the emissions are coming from, but how those are changing over time. Uh, you have uh, quite a long time series build up, and you can get a quite a bit of information from that, see how things go up and down from one year to the next. It may be you know, some sectors that are growing while others are, are decreasing. So the, a lot of valuable information comes from that. Next slide. So kind of the the rule book for doing these local greenhouse gas inventories, there is uh, a couple of approaches out there. They are unfortunately most for the most part uh, well aligned with each other. So is there is the US community protocol. Uh, ICLE USA was the lead in developing this and had a lot of input from our cities that we work with and other local governments we work with to, to develop this. The uh, first version came out in 2012. We just, uh, a few days ago, put out an updated version. It has a new chapter in there on forestry and land use emissions. So I recommend that you, you check that out. Um, again, that's the US Community Protocol kind of focused on data sources and and the needs of U.S. local government. In addition, there is what's called the Global Protocol for Community Scale Commissions, or uh, GPC, and that is a kind of developed similar stakeholder process, a number of um, <laughs> global organizations, uh, so uh, World Resources Institute and C40 Cities kind of taking the lead on that uh, ICLE at the global level, also contributing to the development of that document. As I said, there, these are two are really mostly in alignment with each other. There are a few different kind of in some of the details for how you report your emissions, a, a few specific sources that are, are required in one and optional in another. Uh, most, for the most part, the same as far as laying out what types of data you should use and how you should do the, the calculations to, to measure your, your community greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. 
Um, so it would be pretty difficult uh, for most people to just pick up the protocol and then start collect all the data, do all the calculations to do the inventory. So that's why we made a an online tool to make it, that process a lot easier. That tool is called ClearPath. That's a tool that is we make available to ICLEI members. And so the tool it has five different modules in there, uh, starting with the inventory. So it kind of has fields to enter all the different uh, types of information you need for your inventory. It does all the calculations to recalculate your, your mission. Um, there's a variety of reports that are associated then with that, that inventory to, to see that data. Once there you have your inventory done, the tool also lets you do a forecast of emissions into the future, kind of looking at business as usual uh, growth drivers like population and growth in the number of jobs and be able to use those to, to forecast emissions. And then once you have the forecast, you can bring that into a planning module, which lets you look at different kinds of policies and action the programs that uh, a local government could implement to try to reduce emissions and to try to estimate the, the reductions from each of those, put those together into a kind of an over, overall scenario to be able to get to a, a particular emissions reduction goal. Uh, finally, there is a monitoring and tracking module, which lets you actually track, uh, kind of record the progress of different actions in your plan. So this comes, you know, after you've developed a plan, then you can use the monitoring module to, to track your progress um, to see how actual results and implementation compares to what you had uh, laid out in your plan. And there's also additional reports associated with that. So that's a, a quick overview of the, the ClearPath tool. It's a, an online tool, keeps all your, your data there stored and safely in the cloud, so it's there for future and any uh, user from local government can go ahead on and access that. Next slide, please. All right, so that's kind of the, the background overview. I'm switching to this uh, contribution analysis uh, tool. And so this is something that we developed, uh, finished up about a year ago, and it was, um, I think, a little bit over a year in, in development before that. So about two, two and a half years ago, we initially started this project. It was funded uh, through the Department of Energy City leading through energy analysis and planning program. Uh, MAP shows uh, many of the partners that we worked with on, on this project, as well as uh, some of the other uh, uh, cities that, are, that, uh, that this program worked with on other projects. Next slide, please. So again, one inventory can tell you kind of where your, your emissions are coming from in, in one particular year. Next slide. And multiple inventories can show you how those emissions are changing over time. Next slide. But there's still some, some missing information there about what drove those changes. You may see changes go up and down from, from one year to the next, but not really understand kind of all the different factors that are responsible for those those changes. So that was really the motivation between behind this contribution analysis project was to really dig in deeper and see what we could understand about the changes between two inventory years. Next slide. So what we kind of came up with as, as a product and a way to show that is, is we call this a, a waterfall chart. And so you'll see the kind of starting inventory total on the left and the ending inventory on the right. And then there's kind of a series of bars showing factors that are, are increasing emissions. There's another series of bars that are showing decreased emissions. So kind of this flow up and then, and then down uh, to show the, you know, the overall change 
Uh, but the breakdown of all these different factors, um, you'll see as, as we usually find to be the case that there's you know, the sum of the increases or the sum of the decreases is, is typically larger than the actual overall change between between the the two years. So there are a lot of different factors going on and it's really kind of the, the net impact of all those that we we ultimately see in terms of a overall emissions change. So you'll get to see some more actual examples of these from our our other presenters. Uh, but for now, if we can do the next slide. So just uh, a listing of the, the demonstration cities that we worked with on the project. You'll see that uh, Metro Washington Council of Governments and Delaware Valley uh, Regional Planning Council uh, are both uh, part of our steering committee on, on developing this tool. Um, glad to be presenting with both of them today. Next slide. So the types of changes uh, that we found we were able to, to break apart through this, uh, through the tool is things like emissions factors for electricity, a fuel economy of vehicles. We can look at things like uh, how weather impacted as well as changes in the community itself in terms of population, area of buildings. Um, we wanted to look at the impact of local action that comes out kind of more um, at the leftover than as something that's additional, uh, just kind of directly analyzed. Um, although you can certainly put in inputs for, uh, for actions that you have, have analyzed. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Next slide. So the tool, it looks at the, the inventory, inventory inputs themselves. It kind of separates out relative impacts of emissions factors and the total activity. So activity in this case could mean kilowatt hours of electricity or vehicle miles. <laughs> Again, we look at the uh, relationship with weather uh, and then also looking at uh, kind of per capita, per employment records, and I said subtract to have a, a remainder, which includes results of local action, and potentially a number of other things wrapped up in that, that remainder as well. Next slide. So the, the data that you need to be able to do a contribution analysis, first of all, you'll need to have two inventories. Um, it's very important that you have consistent method between the two so that you're you know, be able to look at actual changes and not just changes that are um, resulting because you use a different method or ch changes that are appearing because there's a different method between the two. Um, you also need some demographic data. So this is uh, mostly available from federal sources, things like number of households, uh, number of uh, jobs in the region. Next slide, please. So in order to account for weather, there is some additional data you need to collect there beyond what's typically done for greenhouse gas inventory. <laughs> so you'll need uh, monthly electricity data rather than just annual. Um, so that's something that requires usually an additional data ask to the, uh, the utilities, the electricity and natural gas providers. Um, the weather data, fortunately, is something that you can go to the National Climate Data Center and just download a file with that. Next slide, please. For local programs, if you want to look at these, uh, you'll need to have already performed an evaluation there. Uh, you do want to make sure you're looking at just what has changed in between the time of your two inventories. Uh, so things that were implemented before your first inventory that wouldn't be having any additional effect um, kind of during that time you're comparing. Next slide. Oh, all right. So it looks like I have uh, 
come toward the, the end of my presentation here. So I want to direct you to the tool. Um, the link is here, pixelusa.org slash PhD contribution analysis. Uh, so there you'll find a downloadable zip file, which has an Excel workbook tool, uh, some various guides, as well as a data request template uh, for those, those data asks you need to make, and a data collection checklist. We also have some recorded online kind of interactive training modules that will lead you through kind of an overview of, of the concepts behind the tool, as well as step-by-step -step through those, for example, the federal data sources where you'll be getting things like households. There's a you know, step-by-step to get that uh, exact data that you need. So that's a, a, a quick overview, but uh, hopefully gives you a sense and hopefully it'll become a little more clear as you see from our other presenters kind of what this actually looks like and progress. Um, I think that is it. one more slide, which is just my contact. All right, thank you for that overview, Eli. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for the overview of both ICLEI and the tools. I know that ICLEI does a lot of different work in this area, so I'd encourage anyone on here to kind of explore some of the other options that they can engage with ICLEI. And I will now hand things over to Maya Davis from Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, who will talk about how they've used some of these tools. Great. Thank you, Eli. Good afternoon or good morning to you, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, my name is Maya Davis uh, from the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. Many of you know us as WASHCOG. I am the Regional Climate Planning Lead and the lead on our greenhouse gas inventory work. And yep, thank you for going to that slide. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, mentioning that um, we've actually been working with ICLEI and coordinating with the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission um, since the beginning of our greenhouse gas inventory work. So it's been a long-term uh, partnership in figuring out greenhouse gas inventories and how to do them to support our local governments and the region. Um, WASHCOG and DVRPC have um, been involved since the beginning in the development of the U.S. Community Protocol that um, Eli mentioned earlier in his presentation. And, you know, so it was really a pleasure to um, continue to work with these partners and the U.S. Department of Energy and other experts on um, this particular project, we did really find their support very valuable to revamping our greenhouse gas inventory work and ensuring we were using the best methodologies. And <clears throat> it really helped us address a direct need of our local government members. They came to us and they asked us, why their greenhouse gas emissions in their communities were changing and they wanted to um, understand them with, uh, you know, what those changes were happening with more data-driven results. And so we turned to ICLEI um, and talked to them about it and it turns out they were hearing the same thing from a lot of communities across the country and so that's where this project originated. Next slide, please. As many of you already know, um, our COG is located in the heart of our nation's capital, ser serving Northern Virginia, District of Columbia, and suburban Maryland. Our region spans out to uh, West Virginia and to touch West Virginia and Pennsylvania on our northwest side. We are split by the Potomac River and span out towards the Chesapeake Bay, which is the large body of water to the right of that map. And our regional vision and mission is to work together towards a more prosperous, accessible, livable, and sustainable future. Next slide, please. Our region forward goals, um, we have nine main goals that are featured here. The vision was adopted by the COG board, locally by all our members, city councils or county commissions, 
and endorsed by several civic and nonprofit organizations, and all of which incorporate these shared goals into their own planning efforts. All of our work here at COG supports the vision and mission. The team I'm on supports the climate and energy goals, including greenhouse gas emission reduction. Overall, our environmental programs address climate, energy, air quality, the Chesapeake Bay and water resource challenges, as well as forestry, agriculture, and food. We also serve as the region's MPO and work on homeland security and public safety, as well as a variety of uh, planning services. Next slide, please. Our climate change program started in 2005, and we provide a variety of support to our local government members to help develop policies, programs, and initiatives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and enhance community resilience. We work towards our goals with our Climate, Energy, and Environment Policy Committee, as well as technical and public advisory subcommittees. Um, we have a broad range of representatives from local, state, and federal officials, utilities and regional authorities, um, nonprofits, businesses, educational institutions are, um, are just some examples of the stakeholders we have involved in the process. And since our policy committee's inception, it's been one of the group's priorities for the region and all our local government members to complete greenhouse gas inventories and track progress towards our shared emission reduction goals. So as a service that we provide to our local government members, we complete greenhouse gas inventories for all 24 members, our Northern Virginia subregion, as well as Metropolitan Washington as a whole. We provide their community's data in ICLEI's ClearPath tool that Eli mentioned in his presentation, as well as offline summary Excel spreadsheets and fact sheets. Some members choose to share these publicly, while others use them internally for planning and program purposes. So far, we have completed local, regional, local and regional inventories for the years 2005, 2012, and 2015. And the next set of inventories are, will be done for 2018 and 2020. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The specific goals that were adopted by our overarching COG board back in 2008 were to get back down to 2005 greenhouse gas emission levels by 2012, reduce emissions by 20% by 2020, back down to 2005 levels, and reduce by 80% by 2050. We are currently working under a 2020 Regional Climate and Energy Action Plan with our stakeholders to work towards meeting these goals. And um, we will kick off the development of our 2030 plan um, this fall. And we have recently become a regional ICLEI affiliate member so that we can um, kind of continue to get their support on our greenhouse gas inventory work, our plan, and as, as well as uh, uh, the next round of our contribution analysis that we'll be doing at the end of our 2018 inventory work. Next slide, please. So this dives in a little bit uh, more into each year of those inventories and breaks it out by sector. Um, overall, we've reached a 10% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions between 2005 and 2015, and that's despite a 14% increase in population. So during this time, our per capita emissions decreased by 22%. That's really good, but it's only halfway to our 2020 goal as of 2015. And you might be able to tell from this slide that our emissions ticked up just a little bit between 2012 and 2015. And that caused a little bit concern and our stakeholders really wanted to understand why. So before the most recent greenhouse gas inventory, uh, all we could really say was we think that fuel switching from coal to natural gas is causing emissions to decrease. But is it really the main contributing factor? What are the other drivers? And how can we evaluate this in a meaningful way? 
So that's where the ICLEI's contribution analysis tool comes in. Next slide, please. So um, these are the initial results for metropolitan Washington as a whole, um, just the top three uh, increases and decreases. And hindsight's 2020, uh, 2012 and 2015 probably weren't the most ideal years to compare. 2012 was uh, much warmer than average winter and 2015 was much colder winter. So that is the main reason that's uh, driving increases between the 2012 and 2015 inventory. And also two other main um, drivers of the change is population and commercial growth. Uh, what's driving our decreases is a cleaner grid, cleaner cars, and less driving per person. And while most of our communities reduce emissions similarly to the region, there was some variation when you drill down and look at each community result. So there were a couple communities that have actually been increasing in emissions since 2005, and others that had more significant reductions. So while these, uh, this table is generally representative of the region, we didn't want to automatically assume that every community's results would look exactly the same. So ICLEI helped train our members and um, helped us run the contribution analysis tool for all of our local government members. So I just want to drill down real quickly to two examples that show a bit of a different story. So if you could go to the next slide, please. I think it's really helpful to have these data-driven results and then be able to apply our local knowledge to interpret what this is saying. Um, sometimes you may know exactly what the drivers mean or where they're coming from, and sometimes it may, might take a bit more investigation. So this example is our Northern Virginia subregion, and uh, it shows a decrease in commercial energy use per, or no, an increase in commercial energy use per square feet as one of the main drivers. And, you know, it, it, it sort of confirmed our suspicions right away. We, we understood um, where that was coming from, and it's the increased commercial energy intensity from data centers. Um, this region has experienced a lot of growth in energy-intensive data centers, and running the tool um, helped us confirm our suspicion and help tell the story of the impacts that these energy-intensive industries have on our local greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. So this example is Frederick County, Maryland, where they experienced a decrease in emissions. And we had to work with staff on this one to interpret um, what the results were saying. Um, having a decrease in um, commercial energy intensity was I think a little bit of a surprise to us on this one, and we weren't exactly sure where it was coming from. And um, some of the local uh, uh, planners uh, told us to look into commercial vacancy. They thought, you know, there was probably a big increase in vacancy. But the trends in um, and what we looked at didn't quite show that. So we drilled down a little deeper to look at a handful of industries that did leave, and it turned out there there, there were some energy-intensive industries that did leave, and we think that that's where um, this driver is coming from. So it took us a minute to figure out uh, um, uh, where that result was coming from. Now, Eli had mentioned uh, local programs and analyzing local programs um, with this tool, and so we tested that out. The local program's result is um, some analysis that Frederick County already had on the impacts of their Green Homes Challenge. It's a very active program. And I think we were really pleased to see that it was that one program serves as one of the top drivers in reducing greenhouse gas emissions in their county. And it really helps that community tell a story about the impact and benefit of their local program and help, you know, kind of justify um, the continued effort um, being put in towards this program. Next slide, please. 
all the project partners uh, put together a summary fact sheet. And this one is our COGS fact sheet. It's available online at the links that uh, Eli had directed you to. Next slide. And this is where you can reach me. Um, and the photo on the bottom is our in-person team meeting at uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab. And in case you're interested, uh, Eli Udall is the tallest person in the back center there uh, with the beard. And Rob Graff, who you'll, you're about to hear from, is in the red shirt. And if you look just a bit further to the left, you'll see me in the bright purple top. So thank you for your time, Eli. Thank you, Maya. Thank you for that uh, overview of how you've used the tools. Really interesting to see those waterfall charts and to hear about how individual programs are able to, to benefit from this analysis. So without further ado, I will pass things over to Rob Graff from Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, who's going to talk to us about uh, how things have been going in the greater Philadelphia region. Great. Good afternoon. Uh, can everybody hear me there? Eli? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm I'm Rob Graff. Uh, I manage the Office of Energy and Climate Change Initiatives here at the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. Uh, I will mirror uh, Maya in thanking Ickley and the uh, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments in the value and pleasure of working over the past decade or more with them on figuring out how to carry out a regional energy and greenhouse gas emissions inventory and to communicate that results to our region. Um, it's a it's difficult. Both of those are difficult, and probably the communication is the harder of the two. Uh, the work I will describe here has been carried out uh, in coordination with my colleagues, Adam Beam and Sean McGill Legender, who is actually in that picture that Maya uh, uh, sh showed as well. Uh, we're out in um, in Golden together. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, DVRPC is the Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO for Greater Philadelphia. Our region includes the City of Philadelphia and the eight surrounding counties in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Our board, the commission itself, is composed of representatives of these counties, the major cities in the region, and of the two states. Uh, MPOs, like DVRPC, are primarily transportation planning organizations, and our board plays a key role in deciding how federal transportation funding gets spent in the region. In order to ensure this investment meets long-term regional goals, however, we are required to develop a long-range plan, which by its nature touches on a lot more than just transportation. Uh, as of 2015, the greater Philadelphia region was home to about 5.7 million people. There are 351 municipalities in the region, all with strong home rule. That means land use and many other decisions are made at the local level. Thus, as MPO staff, we seek to develop helpful planning tools, communicate information and best practices, and generally support our counties and municipalities in creating better futures for their residents. But we really have no authority over policy except for federal transportation spending. Next slide, please. The region's long-range plan, Connections 2045, repeats the previous long-range plan, which was creatively called Connections 2040, uh, goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 60% from 2005 levels by 2040. This is in line with related commitments made by governments in the region, including uh, Pennsylvania and the city of Philadelphia, which have both adopted reduction targets of 80% by 2050. This 80 by 50 goal is often cited as what is needed to limit the global temperature increase to no more than 1.5 degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Next slide, please. DVRPC has a number of activities, areas of activity. As I noted, I manage the Office of Energy and Climate Change Initiatives. My office's mission is uh, both to understand uh, and advance uh, effective and practical policies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the region and to prepare the region for the inevitable long-term impacts of climate change, particularly in the transportation sector. Next slide, please. In order to track progress towards its greenhouse gas reduction role, as well as to help shape 
and inform local energy use and greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategies. DVRPC periodically carries out an inventory to estimate energy use and greenhouse gas emissions for the region. Our most recently completed inventory for calendar year 2015 was published in November 2018. These inventories provide snapshots of energy use and greenhouse gas emissions for the region down to the municipal level. Uh, they're available for 2005 and 2010 as well. The 2005 inventory was one of the first regional uh, greenhouse gas emissions inventories uh, conducted in the U.S., I believe. Uh, it helps to show trends in energy use and emissions, and of course, as I noted, helps to shape energy use and, 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 and emissions reduction strategies in our region. We've provided counties, municipalities, academics, and others uh, the data for their own analyses uh, for regional energy use and greenhouse gas emissions reductions uh, to help them decide your know, work at, at testing out different scenarios uh, for reduction in the region. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2015, uh, stationary energy, this, uh, this Graphic shows the greenhouse gas emissions in our region in uh, metric, million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, you can see the uh, commercial, industrial, and residential applications, stationary energy applications dominated annual greenhouse gas reductions. That's the tallest and second and tallest and third tallest bars, uh, resulting in about 43 uh, million metric tons, or about 60 percent of uh, the region's gross emissions of 75 million metric tons CO2 equivalent. Mobile energy use, the second bar there, primarily transportation, contributed another 23 million metric tons, or about 30% of the region's uh, gross emissions. So altogether, fossil fuel use for energy accounts for just under 90% of the regional gross greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, uh, when I saw Maya's uh, presentation, I realized I did not create a slide that shows our trends over time, but our emissions decreased uh, just over 21% between 2005 and 2015, about a 10% decline between 2005 and 2010, and another 10% between 2010 and 2015. Next slide, please. Uh, so talking about the value of the tool here, uh, the, the, the contribution analysis tool. In the past, we were able to make some broad brush statements about the different factors driving changes in emissions between inventories. For instance, we can easily compare the electricity generation mix from year to year. Next slide, please. And note how the shift away from coal to uh, natural gas, uh, coal dropped almost in half and natural gas uh, almost tripled. Uh, in the course of carrying out our inventories, uh, next slide, please. Uh, reduced greenhouse gas, reduced the greenhouse gas emissions associated with electricity, as you see, from uh, 1,150 pounds of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour to 835 in 2015. And it's certainly lower now as uh, natural gas continues to replace coal. Next slide, please. We could also look at general trends. Uh, in addition to our region-wide estimates, we also allocate energy use and emissions to each of our counties and municipalities. In this uh, slide, the, this is green, greenhouse gas emissions per acre, and you can see the city of Philadelphia, which is rather densely populated compared to much of the region, and the city of Trenton, which is on the border between Mercer County and Bucks County, uh, have the highest emissions per uh, acre in in the region, uh, thus you know that so these densely settled uh, places have the highest emissions per acre, uh, as you can see here. But in the next slide, uh, you can see that they also ha often have some of the lowest emissions per capita. In general, you can draw this draw from this the correlation between dense settlement settlement patterns and everything else that goes along with them including transit service, walkability, and lower emissions profiles. But we couldn't or weren't uh, able to uh, uh, produce a more nuanced look at the factors, different factors that play between inventories. And that's something that the um, emissions contribution tool allows us to do. So if you go to the next slide, you can see um, 
the outputs from uh, ICLEI's contribution analysis tool does allow us to do this on the left side of this uh, graphic um, in the orange bar shows the 2010 inventory at about 84 million metric tons and on the right side 2015 inventory at just over 75 million metric tons uh, and this shows as, uh, as as did Maya the uh, relative impacts of different um, factors on raising or lowering the region's emissions. Not surprisingly, factors that we already knew played a significant role, for instance, electricity generation uh, mix showed us, showed us this, but it did help us do things like separate out the decrease in on-road emissions per mile there, which was our second largest contributor to a decrease from the change in vehicle miles traveled, which actually increased. So it helped us see that things like federal uh, CAFE standards, fuel efficiency standards, and the turnover of the fleet between 2010, uh, the label on this is incorrect, that should say 2010 to 2015 at the top of this, um, uh, it was a very significant role, as was the change in uh, electricity generating mixes. Um, they were also able to see the relative importance of population changes in per capita uh, energy demand and even the effect of warmer weather on our uh, overall emissions total since it's generally less energy intensive to cool than to heat in our region. All this is nicely captured in one place and if you look at the next slide uh, that allows us to uh, create a, a nice one-page or uh, two-sided document summarizing the greenhouse gas emissions trends in our region. Um, and this wouldn't have been able to be have been done without uh, without this this tool. And it helps us provide a great, you know, one uh, one sheet of paper document to our uh, region on talking about our greenhouse gas emissions trends. And the next slide just simply shows my uh, contact information, which I believe is also shown on Eli's final slide. And uh, that's all I have. I guess we're ready for taking questions now. Back to you, Eli. All right. Thank you, Rob. Uh, and, you know, we actually don't have any questions that have come in so far. Uh, so if you do have any questions outstanding, please send them in. Uh, and we'll give you about a minute to get anything in that you'd like to to send. Um, in the meantime, I was wondering if um, either Rob or Maya, if you could talk a little bit about some of the actions that some of your member communities have taken based on the analysis and based on presentations of the analysis. If any communities have, you know, kind of created initiatives based on what they saw from the analysis. This is Maya, and I would probably say that um, Montgomery County, Maryland uh, is a good example. As we were coming out with these results, there um, uh, county elected officials signed on to um, a climate emergency. So they, they declared a climate emergency for the county. Um, and this information for the greenhouse gas inventories and the drivers of change um, directly informed the first steps of their response to that declaration and um, and and sort of helping them kick off with a, a broad range of stakeholders um, on informing them about um, the greenhouse gas inventory trends and what's driving change. And so they, um, I think, benefited from having this information readily available um, and is certainly supporting their process with their stakeholders. Thanks, Maya. Yeah, this is Rob Graff. Uh, we have uh, the our, our emissions inventory itself. We have uh, provided in uh, spreadsheet form to some folks who are working on the Ready for 100 program in the region, and they took our uh, data, raw data, at the municipal level and did some analysis of what would happen if they. Uh, you know, some sort of what if analysis about what would happen if the uh, electricity mix changed or, or uh, a greater number of electric vehicles were on the road or heating uh, fuels were changed from, say, uh, 
uh, natural gas to uh, to just electricity and the electricity grid were greener or from uh, heating oil to uh, natural gas or electricity. So carrying out some what-if scenarios, and that also has been done by some researchers at the University of Pennsylvania uh, on that. And I think that one of the challenges of this, and we discussed this a lot out at our meeting uh, together in Golden, Colorado, is you know many of the things that really affect the big trends are uh, less in control of um, – well, they, they initially may seem less in control of local municipalities than uh, than some other things, I mean, such as the change in electric generation mix. However, that just emphasizes the importance of consumers to select uh, clean energy mixes in their, in their electricity supplier. And then with on-road emissions, the importance of both reducing how many miles you drive uh, or uh, travel with a cleaner vehicle, either a... Um, with a cleaner, cleaner passenger car or with public transit. So it sort of shows the importance of some of those big things relative to uh, some of the things such as uh, recycling, which takes a lot more attention than in, in people's minds, I think, sometimes than, uh, than the actual emissions reductions merit. So it helps us, us and other municipalities sort of understand the value of, of certain actions over others. All right. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate the uh, the answer. We actually just had a few questions come in here. The first is, uh, do you know if the Global Covenant of Mayors is using this platform? I, I guess I can respond to that. Um, probably the organization most in communication with the Global Covenant of Mayors. Um, I am not aware of them using this in any way. Um, I think their focus is mostly on kind of public reporting of emissions from cities. Um, and it's more up to the cities themselves to decide what tools to use to to try to further their uh, their own planning efforts. Thanks, Eli. Uh, another question here is, can you describe the planning actions you are taking now that are informed by the tool? This is, this is Maya. Um, you know, I, I think for us, it was um, a little bit of sense of relief that uh, weather was was a big factor, um, and if we had looked at other years, um, we um, uh, might not have seen an uptick between our latest two inventories. I think there was a lot of concern about um, whether we were, oh my gosh, are we starting to trend in the wrong direction? And I, I don't I don't think that's going to be um, the case, um, but. It was also a good thing in that um, it, it created some sense of urgency and um, sort of helped us um, gain support for, um, you know, hopefully setting strong goals moving forward. We currently don't have specific goals for 2030. And so I think this process um, has helped uh, inform and sort of get our stakeholders um, ready to talk about um, stretch goals beyond what we think we can m might be able to achieve um, because we we probably will get pretty close to our 2020 goal but it's it, it's very likely we could fall short um, and so it helps create a sense of urgency there to to kind of see where things are at and provide some direction on, on what to do. And um, so I think it's really going to help us in our, um, in our process to develop a 2030 uh, climate action plan. Uh, this is Rob Graff. I think it has helped us in, you know, as I said, it provides a very nice uh, graphic for communications to uh, our board and to municipal stakeholders and others in the region, uh, it allows that communication to be done without um, falling into the sometimes uh, into the weeds 
that we sometimes can fall into when we show things by, uh, you know, sort of EPA or international categories. Instead, just say things that people understand, like change in electric generation fuel mix is a lot easier to understand than, you know, uh, commercial stationary energy. Uh, and emphasizes the importance of the state policies and the federal policies as well as local work. So, for instance, I'd say our two major programs at DVRPC related to uh, energy and greenhouse gas emissions are uh, not all of which are in my uh, in, uh, in my office because we, we have 120 people here, but we do work a lot of work on transit and uh, electric vehicles. I've been doing a lot of work on electric vehicles and also work on uh, making the region uh, uh, solar ready. Uh, and so those are, of course, addressed the two largest uh, bars in the contribution analysis for decreasing our emissions. So continuing to build on on those two proven um, strategies is really our, our main focus of our internal efforts. And this has helped support that and reveal the importance of those. Thanks, Rob. This is uh, Maya. This is Maya again. I, Eli, I just actually want to add um, that, you, you know, I, Rob um, really has a clear picture of um, the fuel mix for, for the region. And um, this tool actually cleared some things up for us. Um, you know, there are some regions that could be like the Philadelphia region and some regions that might be like ours where um, we have two different, our region is, is, is split between two different um, uh, U.S. subgrids, if you guys are familiar with eGrid. Um, so Virginia is in one completely different uh, subregion for the grid and DC and Maryland are in a different one and we also have nine different utilities that we have to collect data from each with their own um, electric fuel mix numbers so it was really hard for us to kind of you know kind of summarize and get a grip on a regional picture so we had a little bit harder time um, uh, and less of a picture than Rob had for his region, and so this tool has kind of helped us um, capture it a little bit more easily. Thanks, Maya. All right, we are getting to the end of the hour, but we've got one final question here, and this one's for Rob. DVRPC, are you using a methodology to allocate emissions to each community in your region, or are you building inventories for each one? Uh, we are essentially building inventories for each one. We collect from, you know, most of the emissions are uh, natural gas, related to natural gas use at the home or business, or um, electricity use or automobile use. So for those three, we have our regional uh, green, our regional travel demand model, which uh, is, which allows us to allocate emissions or uh, BMT down vehicles miles traveled and uh, fuel efficiency down to the municipal level uh, based on half of the emissions for a trip uh, are in the origin, originating, destin, or, originating municipality and half of the uh, emissions are allocated to the destination municipality for the trips. We are fortunate to have good relationships with our many utilities, both electric and natural gas, and they have provided us with um, Billing data by billing category, commercial, residential, or industrial, at the uh, either the municipal level for some utilities or at the zip code level, which we then reallocate to municipal level. So these are essentially, uh, you know, excellent starting points for municipalities uh, to carry out their own you know, more detailed. Uh, allocations but it's pretty pretty good it's like 90 percent uh it's as good as they would get for most of the categories because they would look to the utilities for the same data we got and to the municipality or to the uh to us for the transportation data in fact that's what first started this is the our main utility in our region called us and said well we're getting all these calls from people who want to want good electricity data and our modeling office here was getting calls for people who wanted vehicle miles travel data and I said well to make it consistent why don't we just do it for everyone and that's what we did 
I was in the midst of working with my own municipality on our municipal inventory with ICLEI's help. And so uh, it sort of all happened to come together around that time in uh, 2007 or six. Thanks, Rob. And um, thank you also to Maya and Eli for your answers and your presentations earlier. Uh, I know we covered a lot of terrain here, so um, this last slide just has some contact information for everyone. And so don't hesitate if you have more questions to reach out to uh, Eli, Maya, Rob, or myself. Um, I'm happy to pass along any larger or more general questions or questions you have for for um, other regional organizations. Uh, and uh, we will be emailing out a copy of the presentation uh, and a video of this webinar uh, probably tomorrow. And um, I think that's all we have for today. So thank you again to all the presenters and thank you for listening in. Thanks, Eli.